Thank you very much. So I look forward to this fireside chat. And Don, I will pass it on to you. Yep. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Dawn Morgan. I am a patient advocate, an entrepreneur, and the host of the Unquiet Mind podcast. I'm thrilled to be here with these amazing panelists. I, this is, I'm excited to, to moderate this fourth session, a fireside chat on intersectional perspectives and medical technology. I would like to introduce one of our panelists at the end there, Ms. Uh, Tanisha Armstrong. I'm pleased to introduce Ms. Tanisha Armstrong, an educator, advocate, and leader who has spent more than 30 years supporting nonprofits, faith communities, businesses and individuals in moving their missions forward. Tanisha believes in the power of collective purpose and has spent most of her career building multidisciplinary coalitions. Currently, she's pursuing graduate studies in public health at Emory University while navigating widowhood, motherhood, and a chronic autoimmune disease. Tanisha believes strongly in participatory learning, and so in 2022, she was part of the inaugural University of Maryland School of Pharmacy's Patients Professors Academy, which focuses on patient-centered research through community engagement. Welcome. Thank you. And next, I have Dr. Jorge Rodriguez. Hello, Mr. or Dr. Jorge Rodriguez. Dr. Jorge Rodriguez is a hospitalist and researcher at Brigham and Women's Hospital and at Harvard Medical School in Boston. His research and passion lie in the meaningful intersection of medicine, social justice, and technology. He is currently focused on bridging disparities in patient-facing health technology, especially patient portals, mobile apps, and telehealth. Thank you. Welcome. Last but not least, Mr. Michael Crawford, welcome. Thank you. Michael Crawford is the Assistant Vice President for Strategy and Innovation at Howard University's Office of Health Affairs. He is the Founder and Ex Executive Director at Howard University's 1867 Health In Innovations Project, host and executive producer of the 21st Strategic, I'm sorry, of the Century Health Podcast and co-founder of Digital Health X. Mr. Crawford serves as strategic advisor to the Dean of Howard University College of Medicine and Vice President of Clinical Affairs and collaborates with medical science, health academic, and HU board leadership to advance Howard University's academic health and innovation mission. Mr. Crawford is also on numerous national and local committees, including the Advisory Board of National Minority Quality Forum, and member of Robert Wood Johnson National Commission to Transform Public Health Data Systems. Prior to his role at Howard University, Mr. Crawford held leadership positions at Unity Health, Johnson & Johnson, Galax GlaxoSmithKline, Gannett Company, nonprofits, and startups. Welcome to our panelists. Thank you. I would like to start with Tanisha asking you, a question and starting with you and we we have had this discussion prior to uh, meeting here but I would like to know how has medical technology impacted you as a patient as well as a caregiver um, I think that we've talked quite a bit um, and as I've sat here today listening uh, one of the highlights that stood out to me has been the impact of telehealth um, beginning with COVID uh, just for me as a patient and for my family in general. My husband was diagnosed at 44 years old with advanced kidney disease, uh, and it was in 2014 that I was uh, diagnosed with autoimmune disease. So we had been making our way through doing our usual until COVID. Um, when COVID began, we hold ourselves in. He had been on dialysis at that point for two years. He was doing peritoneal dialysis at home. So we had to be very careful about who we were around and what we were doing. And all of our appointments became telehealth appointments. Um, when he suddenly died in July of 2020, uh, we found the day that he died that we were all infected with COVID. So no one could come in my house, no one could go out of my house, and I had COVID. Um, my autoimmune disease, the primary autoimmune disease that I deal with is my gravis, which can cause me to stop breathing. 
and my doctors were highly concerned, the first conversation we had was, we are going to avoid a hospital admission. And I was not functioning. I was in shock. Um, we were all sick. I had no one physically there to help me. And so we went through it with telehealth. Um, I had a patient navigator. She called me every morning. She told me what time my doctor would be available. She told me to have the laptop out. They assessed me. They listened to my breathing. He had me hold my hands out to see if I was shaking from the increased dose of prednisone I had to take every day. They kept me alive. Um, I never went to the hospital. And through this past two and a half years, telehealth has been a lifesaver because I am, my symptoms are exacerbated by stress, which I'm a mother of five. And, um, <laughs> uh, you know, the two oldest don't live with us, they're 25. That in itself. And then um, I have a 21 year old who would like to be the mom. And then I have two teenagers who are just trying to figure it out. So um, at any given time, I want to run out in the street screaming. And um, often I don't feel well. And so this past couple of years, it has been about telehealth. It has been about me having a conversation and my nurse calling and saying, oh, didn't like the way you sounded. Get on in 15 minutes. Um, assessing symptoms, changing treatment plans, just walking us through. Uh, in the midst of it, my daughter developed a cyst in her thyroid. We live two and a half hours from this area. We, so I am in a funny place. I live in the largest city on the eastern shore of Maryland, but in the three lower counties, which are three of the poorest counties in the state. So uh, telehealth has been amazing for us because she didn't have to come to Children's. We met with the nurse practitioner, we met with the doctor through telehealth, and we've proceeded. I have a sister with mental health issues. She uh, was in a facility. My 80 plus year old mother was not able to go and see her. So we set up the laptop in their dining room and my sister's physician had a conversation with my mother via Zoom. Um, it has been essential. And as we were talking about at the table, the greatest concern for many people that I talk to at this point is, when COVID um, things have been changed, will insurers continue to give us the option of telehealth? I would not survive without it. It's not just because of COVID that I need telehealth. Sometimes it's because I can't take that 45 minute drive to my doctor's office. Uh, so that has been a huge piece for me uh, that stands out the most. Absolutely. I, I have another question for you, but I, I wanted to also share, I too um, have faced an autoimmune challenge. I have multiple sclerosis, and I recall having to make a decision about telehealth services or in-person services, and at one point when I, made my, I was making my appointment, um, the practitioner said, I would like to customize this treatment plan for you. And you know, I thought that was a very, very important piece of, of the conversation. And I think when you have a telehealth appointment or when you are setting up those appointments, it's important to have those customized treatment plans available, readily available for you and a clinician who's willing to, to offer that. And so my question for you is, what are ways that you wish medical technology was personalized to you? Um, I think for me, it is really about finding out what my symptoms are, what my needs are, and realizing that they change and that they fluctuate. Acknowledging that uh, the technology needs to be adaptive, uh, that there are times for me when I can't necessarily read. Um, you know, my autoimmune issues have affected my eyes, they have affected my, my sight. So there are times where I'm having to blow up things on screens. Um, when my husband was doing dialysis at home, I was amazed at his machine because there was a digital screen, uh, but there was also voice prompts and we could change the language on it. Like when we first got it, we sat down and just played with it. There were all kinds of different ways that it could be adapted. So as some of the other speakers have talked about, people with blindness, people who are hearing impaired, um, people whose symptoms may not always be the same, people who have to consider you are carrying, you are wearing a black uh, insulin pump. Like there are all sorts of things that need to be considered. So I think for personalization's sake, I believe that the patient needs to be able to speak. 
Speak to those who are making decisions. Speak to those who are um, saying that they want patients to be engaged, but not necessarily willing to hear what patients have to say, um, and realizing that we are our best advocates. I consider for myself the fact that I am the advocate, and I was sick and grieving, and I needed advocates. And I didn't have to make the phone calls. Like, everybody called bossing me, which is, <laughs> I don't do that. They know, I'm the boss. Um, but there are many people whose life and death exists because they don't have a voice, and they don't have someone else to be their voice. So I believe that there is a lot of listening that has to take place. And that's what customizes things, that's what makes them work, and that's what saves lives. Absolutely. And what would you tell the research community about how they could do better? Um, I have a flyer. <laughs> for, the, in, for the upcoming class of Patients Professors Academy. Joe, where are you? <laughs> Joe, back in the corner, is our, my resident expert. He's the reason I'm sitting here today, but he was also the person that I've worked with for more than a year now in the Patients Professors Academy. I believe that you have to get in the trenches with the people that you want to serve. Um, and I don't believe that clinicians don't want to engage. I think many clinicians don't know how. And so if you find circumstances and places and spaces where everyone is allowed to speak, then you're going to get what you're looking for much faster than any other way. Absolutely. The relationship between patient and clinician is very, very important yes. in establishing trust and a, a foundation of communication. Yes, definitely. Absolutely. Michael, hello. How does your work at Howard University 1867 Health Innovations Project nurture innovation in the medical technology space and incorporate patient-centered perspectives and data? I know that's kind of a different segue, but we're moving right along. They're very much interrelated and it dovetails well with the question that you asked Tanisha about how you develop solutions that are personalized for patients' experience, and I'll, and I'll touch on that, but I just want to thank the National Health Council for the opportunity to be here, uh, thank the advocacy community, obviously, for all the work that you do on behalf of the millions of patients, domestically as well as internationally, to ensure that they receive a high level and quality health care. So thank you for, for all that you do. In terms of 1867, uh, 1867 was founded April 2020 with a express mission of collaborating with researchers, entrepreneurs, technologists, and corporations to tackle complex challenges confronting medically underserved and vulnerable communities from a digital health perspective. We started to contemplate the idea prior to COVID. So this was something that we were considering prior to COVID. And COVID essentially accelerated our work and our thinking within this space. Prior to, to the development, like many projects, we did an exhaustive analysis, right? We did a qualitative analysis and a quantitative analysis, an extensive literature review to see what literature was out there relative to digital health in medically underserved communities. To my surprise, there was very limited amount of information in the space. Today, there's still a limited amount of information with respect to the intersection of medically underserved, vulnerable, and digital health. Then visited all of the innovation, the vast majority of the large innovation spaces throughout the country, all of which were doing incredible work in this space, but no one was solely focused on working at the intersection of digital health, health data, and medically underserved communities. Howard, uniquely positioned to take on this charge, uh, a university that historically has studied healthcare disparities, health equity issues. We, are, we have core competency in the area. We also are one of the unique institutions that train all health science schools. So we have a medical school, a college of pharmacy, a college of dentistry, a college of nursing and allied health. So we thought we were uniquely positioned to establish 1867. And largely our work centers around thought leadership, digital health research, uh, as well as organizing programs, outreach programs, and collaborating with different collaborators to amplify the conversation with respect to digital health and medically underserved. Our work really is about centering the patient, centering the patient and the provider or the end user. And often when I'm a part of these conversations, we use that term end user interchangeably. And we think solely about patient. 
But in the context of healthcare, that means provider, that means patient, and largely caregiver, right? In terms of who technologists are solving for. So we currently have uh, active pilots within the diabetes space, and one of which I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about. Uh, we, are, we looked at some of our clinical delivery models within Howard to determine whether or not they were well suited to fit with technology. If the model didn't exist, we would build a model that would support the use of technology to look at a couple things within diabetes, medication adherence, management of hemoglobin A1C levels, and we're primarily looking at a digitally naive population. And when I'm using the term digitally naive, individuals that have never used a digital health solution to manage their condition. And I'm talking about individuals above the age of 65. So we put together this clinical pilot project. We sourced technology from some of our partners. And the technology that we identified was a device that dispenses medication that has natural language processing capabilities, facial recognition capabilities, and also some telehealth capabilities to be able to create a engaging relationship between provider and patient. Um, and we had inclusion criteria for the research community and exclusion criteria. And in short, the device in a digitally naive population improved medication adherence, hemoglobin A1C levels, and a large number of quality of life factors over a short period of time. So much so that folks that have never used this technology said they would recommend it to a friend. So what's the point of, this, of these clinical pilot projects? A lot is about validation. A lot of solutions on the market today are not supported by data, evidence, and research. And health insurers and providers are trying to determine what are the best solutions that work well for their patients. So we're trying to do some of this validation work to help de-risk some of these solutions for our partners, providers, the advocacy community, to ensure that they have the evidence and research that they need to recommend these solutions with a great deal of confidence. The other piece that we recognize is that there are some other factors involved. A number of the patients we, that wanted to participate in this clinical pilot project and others did not have access to broadband. And if they did have access to broadband, they didn't have access to a sufficient level of broadband. Also, digital literacy was very low amongst our patient base. Similarly, was low amongst some of our workforce. So how can you have a provider community that recommends a solution when they don't feel comfortable with technology? So we recognized there was a lot of work to do in ensuring that folks had access to broadband to ensure that they could use and optimize these solutions. And also, we had to put forth some efforts either independently or in collaboration to make sure that we were bolstering digital literacy amongst our patient community as well as our, our providers. Lastly, we were giving our students, we, we provide an opportunity for our solutions across health sciences to be engaged in these digital health research projects and introduce them to cutting edge technology very early in their careers. So when they go off and work for a health system, Howard's or others, that they're familiar with cutting edge technology and they're able to recommend and deploy within their clinical settings. I have a question and I, I just wonder when these patients were experiencing um, broadband issues or um, just digital illiteracy challenges, were they reluctant to move forward? Were they feeling as if oh, they're going to use me as a guinea pig, so I'm already struggling from, from the start, so I think I'll just end this. Yeah, I think your question is twofold, and it touches on uh, one of the most important components in conversations in healthcare today is around trust. Yeah. Right? So COVID illuminated that we have a huge trust problem within our healthcare system. I think prior to COVID, we operated under a notion of perceived trust. Now we're moving to a paradigm of earn trust. So we as providers, technologists, entrepreneurs, what are we doing to earn the trust of patients, communities, and families? And a lot of that work and conversations is occurring right now and has been occurring over the past several years because what we've seen with COVID is that folks have been distrustful of receiving a vaccine, uh, going to receive a COVID test, going to interact with a provider simply because of historical events 
systematic barriers and structures and other things. So Howard being a trusted partner of the community, we're viewed as a trusted partner. We were able to use some of that currency that we built up with the community over the past centuries and decades to really talk to them about engaging in these projects around technology. Because if you're not engaged as a patient, you'll never reach the personalization component that Tanisha talked about. Or we'll never be able to have your data to use to power the innovation and iteration of some of these technologies. So not only is it about communicating and working with patients and leveraging our historical relationships with some of our communities and populations, but it's also being transparent and upfront with our patient community about how their information is being used, what their contribution to science and research means, not only to their community, but to the future of this digitization of healthcare. Yes, and Tanisha and I were, were talking about that trust factor and with certain demographics, particularly going into a, a particular community, uh, for example, a church. Churches, is, that's ultimately where a lot of indiv individuals, especially the older populations, get information disseminated. And I think that they do have a trust within that community and they feel that, okay, well, if, if the pastor is giving this information, then it should, it should be fine for me to move forward and research and, and possibly participate. So yes, that's great, wonderful, thank you. Jorge, how can the research community support digital inclusion and equity in healthcare? Yeah, it's a great, great question. I, I build off uh, the great uh, discussion that uh, both my uh, co-panelists have had here. I think for me as a researcher and as a clinician, my sort of my, my life force really drives from like good questions, right? That's like what really drives us every day. What's a good question? And the only way I'm able to really figure out what are good questions is are by talking to stakeholders, patients to figure out what are the real pain points and challenges that patients and clinicians are facing. And so the most important thing for me and something I've been doing all of today has been mostly, and has been said, listening. I've just been listening to what are the pain points, what are people really struggling with? And that sort of reminds me of a few different, different stories that I'll try to hit on here. Uh, one story is we've been doing some, uh, similar to Michael, doing some work with uh, Latino patients with type 2 diabetes around their experience with telehealth and video visits and trying to address some of the gaps as we've talked about with digital literacy and all these other kind of digital inclusion pieces. And one of the most interesting conversations I remember having was with a woman who had uh, type 2 diabetes, Latino, Spanish speaking, and we were talking about video visits and telehealth, and she was just like, oh yeah, video visits, you know, saves me time on parking, like I don't have to drive in, like all these like great things. And I was like, oh great, and I was like, all right, let's say next time you go into your do a primary care doctor's office, they offer you a video visit. And she's like, oh gosh, no. No, I love my doctor. I want to go see him in person. I want to go say hello, shake their hand. So I think it was like this very kind of interesting moment of like, had I stopped and just been like, oh, she understands. Like I sort of went in with my preconceived notion of being like, telehealth is good. And then there's some level, I think, in, in our general conversations to say, there's a little bit of like what some call like techno-optimism, like technology is good. And I think it's also good to balance that with some, some techno-skepticism. Where is technology good? For this patient, you know, technology was good. And I'll, I've heard this for a few patients, like during the COVID times, that was good, yeah. But like, oh yeah, but now I wanna go in and see my doctor. So sort of understanding that piece. The other piece where I listened to was more about community stakeholders. And one of the things that really struck me and was kind of a huge learning point for me, I had written this piece around, I think the piece was called, um, How a New Technology Landscape Impacts uh, Latino Communities. It was a very kind of researchy kind of perspective to write, because we wanna, you know, us researchers like to hear ourselves write and speak. So I put that out there. And one of the things that, uh, that came up was someone, and this is, I couldn't believe it, they were like, oh, well, I see you wrote this in English. Would this be available in Spanish? And I was just like, I hadn't planned that. And it was such a moment of like, you're, you're talking about a community that's both bilingual, English and Spanish speaking, and you're trying to provide this information, talk about technology. Like, who are you really writing to, right? I was writing, I guess, to my fellow colleagues, but I was really writing about this community. I was just excluding them. And so we went ahead and worked with a journal to have it translated, at least translated. It probably wasn't translated for literacy level, but at least it was translated. Now the article's available for both English and Spanish. And so it feels like I'm including the community a, a, a bit more. Um, so it's a lot about sort of like listening to those, those pieces. And I think the last thing I'll highlight around listening, this was more with, within, the, within the clinic, is, is um, 
one of the key things we heard from, from clinicians was sort of the gap that we often hear in terms of like patient portals, which I'm sure people have very strong feelings, especially in a group of advocates around <laughs> patient portals and how great and not so great they are. Uh, but um, one of the big challenges that, we, that there was a primary care clinic was the digital literacy piece. How do we address that? Sometimes the, the long game of, of design and of like, we're gonna build a better system is sort of a long game, but, but in the short term, what do you do with a patient who is non-English speaking, who's limited English proficient, or who has low health literacy? And one of the things I often like to do whenever I give a presentation, especially if, especially if I'm speaking to a healthcare system, I go on the day the night before, and I go to their website, and I go to their patient portal, and I just take a look. What language is it, is, is it available in? And, it, and when you sort of make this, this concept now of like the digital front door in healthcare, and you go to the digital front door, and it's available only in English, or even only in Spanish, where you served a large like Haitian Creole speaking population, what does that mean if you're saying like, well, here's the digital front door of healthcare, but not, not to you, like we're not, we're not there yet. So, so, so I think that's the other piece. And so when we're thinking about that, we sort of developed this concept of like digital health navigators, a little bit of patient navigation with more of like a, a digital component to it to help patients kind of enroll and use the portal and use telehealth. Um, and some of that, the organization has taken that to, to include, patient, you know, include up to some of our top six languages that we care for. And all that came through just kind of like listening, trying to answer the right question because in the, in the end, like, our resources are finite, right? And for some patients, like, investing in some aspects of their social determinants of health might be a better, better investment than going and, like, you know, implementing the latest and greatest technology where, like, you know, you don't know what, what impact it's going to have. So, I don't know, it's a lot of listening and a lot of, like, I don't know, for me, a little, being a little bit technoskeptical sometimes to kind of take a step back and say, like, is technology really the right use case? Should we really invest in here or should we invest it in another, in another use case that might be more impactful? And aside from being a hospitalist, how has your experience as a caretaker and advocate allow you to understand the challenges of the patients you serve? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I'm just starting my, my own journey. My, my wife, speaking of autoimmune diseases, my wife over the past few years has been diagnosed with a couple of autoimmune diseases, multiple sclerosis being one of them, and then just literally three weeks ago with rheumatoid arthritis. And so seeing her kind of go through the, the process has gave me kind of a brand new perspective on everything because I'm so used to being the clinician on kind of one side of the equation and now having to be a care partner. Um, and it, it just, I think, makes real very like simple things. And, and I think perhaps I was like naive in, in my perception, but even, you know, for example, like pill burden was a concept that I sort of understood in my mind but didn't really have a chance to really understand until my wife was like, hey, can you help me like set up my pills for the week? And I was like, oh, sure. And I was thinking, I was gonna be like, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we're done, and off you go. And she was like, and here's another two, and here's another, and I was like, wait, there's more, and twice a day, <laughs> multiple times a day. And so I think that's given me a new understanding of what it's really like. And I, I see her, I think the, the other big thing is just sort of like, as a hospitalist, we discharge patients and we say, okay, follow up with so-and-so, follow up with so-and-so. And having my wife do that, the follow-up piece is like, she spends like hours on the phone, on the portal, on the thing, just trying to get, and then like, and we are like fairly, you know, high health literacy folks, and I can only imagine, you know, having grown up as an immigrant to this country, like we had the same issues, no wonder like, you know, stuff falls through the cracks. So I think it's, that's given me a new perspective on like what it's like to navigate this healthcare system, and it's just been, it's, it's a full-time job, it's, 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 it's tough. And my, my wife, yeah, I, I, I give her all the props, and I don't know how she, how she does it, and I think someone mentioned the kind of impact of like mental health and chronic disease. I think that's in a whole other kind of combination where all those kind of things impact impact you. So it's given me a brand new perspective. I'm just I'm just starting to to kind of learn and understand about. Absolutely, thank you. And I guess this question is for everyone here. Uh, do you all have recommendations for how we can use technology to increase the outcomes of patients? who do not speak English as their first language? Um, that's the first part of the question. Or maybe that's just for you, Jorge. <laughs> I, I can, I can, I can chat about it. You know, I think, I'll, I'll just say that, um, I, I think there are, I think in the, in like the big picture, in like the long term ideal, you would be like, oh yes, like all these like chat bots, and language learning models and machine translation, won't that be like a great thing? And that's like great like down the line. I think in the short term really, I think it's about kind of going back to like the addressing the analog challenges that we had, right? One of the big challenges we had with patients with uh, limited English proficiency or non-English language preference 
is the lack of use and availability of interpreters. And so really trying to advocate, one, for that, like interpreters are not you know, reimbursed. There's just sort of like an out-of-pocket cost of the hospitals. And I think working with our clinical teams to see how do we integrate those more. And there's some work done with like the kind of like video phones and the audio phones and the whole thing. But even that uptake is not, not robust. I have a colleague who's uh, working on a project where they're actually kind of shifting it around and they're actually giving the patient sort of like the interpreter on their phone to try to make it a little bit more kind of like patient driven. And so he's, he's working on that. So that's a good example of the way, he, and it's a sort of app based. And so he's using technology to kind of drive, drive, at, drive at that, that piece of it. But, I think to some extent it's like, you know, our, our kind of analog challenges don't go away in the digital space. They're, they're still there and just kind of continuing to advocate for those, those kind of um, culturally, culturally and linguistically appropriate care. Can I just touch on that question? Sure, please? sure. <clears throat> One of the things that we've been working on is really having meaningful, engaging conversations with the venture capital and private equity space. Mm. So as they think about seeding new technologies in thinking about products and solutions, they can think about language as a key category um, to being able to scale or being able to engage a new market. So for some of these VC firms, this is a new notion. They're looking at quick returns, quick exits, uh, but part of the exit, part of the return might be engaging what they call a different addressable market, which is uh, a market that speaks a different language. Uh, and it seems like a, it's a lot of rep receptivity to the notion, and entrepreneurs are starting to think about building their platforms in multiple languages. And I'd like to piggyback on that. Uh, in the area where I live, one of the things that we developed during COVID was a vulnerable populations task force. One of the things that we were concerned about was language. We have a large influx of non-English speaking, Haitian Creole, and Spanish citizens. I live in a very rural area uh, where English is the primary language, and there was not any consideration given to these audiences. So the concerns when COVID began was information about lockdown. We have a lot of people who work in protein plants. So they're chicken processing plants. They weren't getting information. They live in communal housing. They were getting sick. They were, did not have PPE. It was all kinds of stuff going on. And one of the things that we have come to the conclusion is that something needs to be created in terms of pipelines for venture capital for young people who are going into, uh, or who have the ability to go into these spaces and be the voice at the table for people who speak languages other than English. Part of that is because when in reality you think about it, a lot of kids are interpreters for their parents. They've spent their entire life interpreting for their parents. So why can that not become a career avenue for them, which both benefits mm -hmm. them personally benefits their family, their community, and then benefits the larger healthcare state. So we've talked about, we have begun the process of creating a community interpreter program, but the larger vision is to be able to move into those spaces where we're creating pipelines for that to happen. I, I, I have two parts to the last question I have for everyone. How do you encourage health literacy is important, it's critical to having positive health out outcomes. When you're sitting down with your clinician, you want to be informed. You want to know what's going on. You want to know certain medical technology. I'm not saying that everyone should become a professional patient because that's difficult, uh, but how do you encourage that and, um, and support patients, Dr. Rodriguez, and, and your fellow advocates or people that you may know or people in your studies, how do you encourage them that health literacy is very critical to their, their health outcomes? I'll, I'll take it first and I'll just be brief so we can have some audience questions if, if we have time. Um, I think one thing about healthcare, healthcare is an, an event that folks are focused on when something happens to you, right? We don't really have a health and wellness culture, right? We, you hear us when we talk about healthcare, we're largely talking about chronic disease management. We're not looking upstream at how do we incent and create a health and well-being culture. So the health literacy piece is very large because health literacy is understanding point and site of care. It's navigating insurance plans. Mm -hmm. It's understanding pharmacy benefits and medications on formula. It's such a large, convoluted category. 
One thing that, that I'm seeing on the entrepreneurship side is folks are really becoming therapeutic and disease state specific. So that if it's someone that has cancer or prostate cancer, they're creating solutions for the prostate cancer community, right? And it's a turnkey comprehensive solution that incorporates literacy and a feedback loop that allows them to push out information and iterate and, and make sure that they're aligning and meeting the needs of that respective community. Uh, but it is the, the foundation of healthcare. And the last health literacy data I looked at, health literacy is extraordinarily low in the US despite social economic status. And so I think it's the challenge of the 21st century and one in which we should double down on as a health advocacy community as well as uh, a total system. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just say that I think it's, for me as a, as a clinician, the reality was I rely on, on the team. Team includes everyone, including peers and other patients to help kind of drive the, the point. I think that health literacy kind of speaks to like a larger societal challenge around education and all these other pieces that I feel like the healthcare system can be like one touch point in that, that point, but really relies on kind of like these larger community efforts. So I think just the community and team-based kind of approach to to, uh, to care is sort of where I would, I would kind of point to. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And what can the patient advocacy community do to support these patients? Uh, I think we need to advocate for them to be advocates for themselves. Um, I think that's the most important thing is to empower people to say, this is your health, it is your body, it is your disease state, it is your situation. And the bottom line is you have to make some decisions and you're going to have to advocate. And if you don't feel strongly that you can do that, take someone with you that will support you or who will become your advocate. And those are really the only ways. We have to empower people to do that. And you know, one of the things like I tell my kids all the time, everybody's not your cup of tea. So sometimes the provider is not the one for you. And that doesn't mean they are not a good provider. It simply means that they're not a good provider for you. So we have to be willing to make those choices. And sometimes the most difficult thing is, depending on where you live, you don't have those choices. So those are, that leads us into all the other things. We could have a million conferences. And, and I'll just amplify the point quickly and say that agency in this era of consumerism that we're transitioning into. And I think that digital solutions are playing a role in that consumerism of healthcare. I, I think I see everyone has some sort of wearable Apple Watch, Fitbit, et cetera, on their arms. And they're constantly looking at their data, making sure that they're receiving their steps. So I said, as we transition to this new era of healthcare around consumerism, it is vitally important that patients are equipped with the skill sets and information to be able to advocate for themselves. And last question for you, Tanisha. Do you see gender equity as an issue that affects your and others' experiences as a patient? Oh, indeed. Um, yes, very much so. I once, early in my diagnosis and my struggle with myasthenia, went to a male physician and told him that the medication was causing me to have tunnel vision. And I said, I have young kids at home and I am afraid my husband is gonna be at work and I'm gonna fall down the stairs and frighten my children to death. And I said to him, what are the other options? And he looked at me and said, if you are not gonna do what I tell you to do, there is no need for you to return. Oh. And I remember walking out and my husband looked at me like I was on fire. And he looked at me like, <laughs> I came through the lobby, I was like, hey, we don't, let's go. <laughs> um, I never saw him again. I loved his nurse practitioner, but once he said that to me, I realized if I'm in a pickle and I say something to him and he ignores it, I'm gonna be in trouble. So in 2017, I was admitted and I was in a complete crisis. My primary care physician came to me and said, I want to put you on the vent. And I said, no, if you put me on the vent, I'm not coming off. And the respiratory therapist was standing there and he said, we can try the BiPAP and if it doesn't work, then we'll vent you. And I said, that's fine. Um, and I remember, even to this day, when my primary care physician and I talk about it, he's like, I thought you were nuts. But because I was not on the vent, we realized I have a drug allergy. 
And I said to my nurse, every time you medicate me, I can't breathe. Um, they left the BiPAP running. Like I became a quasi-respiratory therapist. They left it running in my room so that I could put it on myself. And it was through that conversation when I was crashing the, for the last time, the doctor was looking through my chart and said, don't give her this med anymore. And that was why you see me sitting here today. Um, if I had been with that other physician, he would have overruled what I said, put me on the vent, and I would not have survived. So I believe that equity is essential, and that if someone is not seeing you as a person and a voice, understanding that you have a true knowledge of what you deal with every single day, then something has to change. Something has to change because it is life or death. I'm, a, I'm an example of that. Powerful, powerful. Thank you for sharing. And now we will turn to the audience for Q&A. It's me again, hello. <laughs> um, my name is Meg Didier, I'm with the Global, Global Liver Institute. And Dr. Rodriguez, your um, now experience as a caregiver, I don't have so much of a question as a comment. From a patient perspective, what we need to drive change is data-driven results and data-driven um, just anything mm. that has us involved. And so my thought for you potentially is to Create a paper with your wife, maybe, about what it is like to go from a clinician to a caregiver, and that could really help in identifying some gaps, having those two perspectives coming together so you can speak from a clinician perspective as well as a caregiver perspective, and I feel that would be very, very powerful for all of us. That, well, yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you for that one. As you, as you said it, my, my heart uh, skipped the beat a little bit there. I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I'm still working through why that is, but I, it skipped the beat there. So yeah, I, I think that's, thank you for that recommendation. I appreciate it. I would like to thank the amazing panelists, Mr. Michael Crawford, Dr. Jorge Rodriguez, and Ms. Tanisha Armstrong. Thank you so much for being on the panel. Thank you, everyone, for, for this session, and uh, we look forward to chatting. <laughs>